talk that I gave yesterday on the open questions on the original slide, because I will talk today about viruses and what is their place in biology. And viruses, as you possibly know, and if not, you will hear about that, are somehow placed at the border between living and non-living. So some people think they are living entities, other people think they are not living entities. So these uh, ele ent ent entities have somehow interfered and been mixed with the debate of what's life and how it originated. So first I will give a very general introduction about how viruses were discovered and what do we know today about viruses, their diversity and their function. And then we will uh, revisit how uh, viruses were mixed in this debate on the origin of life since, since the very beginning. And I will focus on some uh, recent ideas of, of how uh, proposing that viruses were very important in the origin of life and, and proposing that viruses are alive today. And we will try to dissect these ideas in two ways analyzing one, a more conceptual debate, uh, uh, trying to see whether viruses are alive or not, depending according to the definitions, and also we will center uh, in a, uh, what I would call a phylogenetic debate, uh, that is to, to say whether viruses can be, uh, uh, or can form, or at least some viruses, a fourth domain of life or not. Can the viruses be placed in the tree of life? So this is the general outline of my, uh, of my talk today. So viruses. Uh, viruses were discovered at the onset of the 19th century, uh, and it was a series of events that led to their discovery. First, uh, Dmitry Ivanovsky in 1892, discovered that suspensions of uh, uh, plant tissues that had, uh, were infected with mosaic tobacco disease were still infected uh, after having passed them through filters that should retain bacteria. But he um, interpreted this observation as uh, something wrong with, the, with, its filter, with these filters. So he thought that he had leakage in these filters so that uh, there were some bacteria or something like that infected. But this was this observation. Then, a bit later, uh, the Dutch uh, 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 scientist Martinus Weijer made a similar observation with uh, mosaic mm, mm, tobacco disease. But in this case, he interpreted uh, this same observation in another way, saying that the infective agent in this time, the virus, and he used for the first time the, the he coined the term virus, was the liquid. So he thought that really the liquid was the infective agent. And uh, my, a, a bit later, or more or less at the same time, but, uh, a bit later, other scientists, uh, Lofner and um, Paul Frosch, um, made again a similar observation with another type of uh, uh, illness, uh, an infective illness, the foot and mouth disease, uh, but they could, uh, re uh, they could show that uh, the infective power of this filtrate uh, was eliminated when the filter, this filtrate was passed through filters with even smaller pores. So they uh, concluded that the positive agent that is the virus, uh, corresponding to filterable particles. They were particles, very tiny particles, but not the liquid. So this was uh, the identification of, of the true nature of viruses as a stream, uh, streaming in, in uh, small infectious particles. And a bit later, uh, two other authors, Frederick Thorpe and Felix Dahlem, in France, uh, discover viruses infecting bacteria, which they call bacteriophages. So this is a very uh, historical introduction about how viruses uh, were discovered. But now, what do we know about viruses today? So we know that viruses are strict molecular parasites. So they depend on the cell to carry their uh, uh, to develop their uh, infective and reproductive cycle. So viruses can infect the cell in two major ways. 
one cycle that is called Liti, when the, the virus injects its genetic material, different points in the cell, and then multiplies rapidly within the cell, leading to its breakage and, and lysis, so uh, and uh, reproducing this cycle over time. Or sometimes they can enter an histogenic cycle where the genome of the virus can be inserted into the chromosome or, or chromosomes of the cell, can be a bacterium, can be a caveat, and then remain there silent for generations before it starts or enters again a lysis cycle, which is usually achieved by uh, some change in environmental conditions, some kind of stress. So that's the general picture. We know that viruses can, or viruses can be classified, are classified today according to a variety of criteria, uh, such as the kind of their genetic material, their shape, whether they have, uh, what is the, the structure of their capsid, whether they have an envelope, uh, usually a thinning envelope or not, whether they have additional structures such as uh, head and tail viruses, they have a tail appendices, and uh, according to the uh, nature of their host, the type of host that they parasitize. But the most important point is possibly the type of genetic material that can be very valuable. If, uh, you have viruses of DNA, RNA, single-stranded, double-stranded, positive, negative, and RNA viruses with DNA intermediate, DNA viruses with RNA intermediate. So a large variety of viral genomes uh, that are uh, around there. So these features are used by a committee, international committee on the taxonomy of viruses to class them in a system that, is, uh, uh, that mirrors somehow the linear classification that is used for organisms, for cells, cellular organisms. And actually they define species uh, which are defined as classes of uh, polythetic classes of viruses that constitute a replicating lineage and occupy a particular niche, that means a, a host. And then they, there are more than 2,000 viral species described today uh, by this committee and distributed in general, families, etc., and so on. So a, a system similar to that of uh, the linear one used for organisms. Of course, as in the case of organisms, the diversity of the number of species that are described is far less uh, than the real diversity that's, that is known and work during the last uh, few years has actually shown that the diversity of viruses is much more important than, than the diversity that we know now or the diversity of described by the viral species. So working in, in recent work in, in the last few years or maybe 10, 15 years has shown that viruses are very abundant in nature. So this is a picture of oceanic waters and you, you see all the tiny spots are supposed to be virus. Even if there, there, might, rise, there might be some artifacts, so this is water that has been pre-filtered through filters that should retain bacteria, so in principle you have only particles that are smaller than bacteria that are stained with uh, WHO or other DNA stain uh, agents, so meaning that these might be potentially viruses. Even if there are some artifacts, because WHO stains also other kind of particles, viruses are nevertheless very abundant in nature. So some people have made estimates that might very a little bit, but still, even if the biomass of viruses is not very important because they are very small, they are many. And because they are many, in terms of abundance, they are really much more abundant than cells. Okay? That is in nature, that is in the ocean, but it may be the same, the same in other environments such as soils. Um, in any case, they are abundant. Not only that, they are also uh, extraordinarily diverse, and this has been shown by uh, metagenomic analysis of what people say uh, of viruses, and this is done by sequencing genomes of viruses uh, collected from the environment. So the idea here is that you take water from the sea, for instance, and you filter all the cells, you retain the cells in filters, and what passes through these filters usually 0.22 micron filters, is supposed to correspond to viruses. 
and then you can collect this fraction, sequence all the DNA or RNA in the case uh, of uh, RNA viruses, and then study what the genes present in this fraction look like. And this, are, uh, this is a, a, a graph coming from a review uh, dating already for, for some years, but it is illustrative in any case, because you see that when you do that, actually you have that uh, there is a fraction of genes that are similar to uh, cellular genes in bacteria, here some uh, eukaryotes. Uh, there is a fraction of genes that are that, are, uh, that match or uh, have similar uh, genes in the databases corresponding to viruses, but most of the genes in this fraction have no similarity with anything in databases, suggesting that there is a diversity of viruses out there that is very important and that we haven't studied yet. And it is the same for RNA, or even worse, for RNA viruses in the environment. So all the gray areas correspond to things that don't match anything in databases in terms of gene similarity. And this is uh, a fraction that likely corresponds to RNA viruses. So this indicates that viruses in nature are extraordinarily diverse and that they represent a large reservoir of, of, gene, uh, of, gene, of genes in general. So viruses are, because they are abundant and diverse, they are very important uh, players in ecology, for the ecology of a system. <coughs> They are known to control population sizes, for instance, in oceans, where you have a bloom of algae for it, uh, or, or other kind of organisms, can be cyanobacteria. They are known as, uh, for, uh, uh, as uh, they are known to terminate blooms, and that is, they, they, they control the population of organisms that bloom at a given time in the year. They are, by that uh, activity, uh, very uh, important in biogeochemical cycling, in particular in the cycles of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, because they mobilize these elements from uh, organisms, either heter heterotrophic or uh, uh, photosynthetic organisms, to the dissolve and particulate organic matter. So this is a function that is called as the, uh, as the viral shunt. So they facilitate the entrance in these pools of organic matter of uh, molecules and, and elements coming from organisms. So and this is uh, a considerable activity. So in terms of biomass, it's, it's really important. And finally, they are also very important because they can maintain biodiversity by uh, uh, a strategy that is called kill the winner. Uh, this is a little bit uh, summarizing this slide. So if you go out, out there in nature, for instance in plankton, that uh, many authors have studied for this purpose, you can have different types of organisms. Uh, uh, Bacteria, for instance, summarized here by different colors and let's say ecotypes of different types of organisms. At the given point, one of these organisms may have a mutation or uh, acquire a gene by horizontal gene transfer that confers it some particular advantage. And then it multiplies, it divides and grows clonally. So you have a larger population of an organism that, because of any reason, um, has acquired an advantage. At that very moment, there will be some kind of virus that will affect this organism. So dominant organisms in a population are more easily attacked, uh, are the targets of viruses, specific viruses, that will bring this organism down to lower levels, and this will facilitate the persistence in the system of uh, uh, of a diversity of organisms that are in lower abundance but that are less affected or less likely affected by viruses. So this will tend to keep uh, a system at a high level of diversity. That would explain what people uh, have known for a long time as the paradox of the plankton. Why so many different species coexist in the same environment uh, uh, that is relatively homogeneous. Well, one, one potential explanation is uh, the control exerted by viruses. Okay. 
So they are important in ecology just because of that. They control uh, populations and they maintain biodiversity. Viruses are also very important in evolution, partly because of the activities that I just mentioned. And in this sense, they have been studied, but also for other reasons. In, in, I just mentioned that uh, for many, many years, viruses have been used in, uh, as models in population genetics because uh, to test a variety of hypo uh, evolutionary hypotheses because they have large population sizes, they evolve very fast, so you can have a, n a big number of generations uh, per, uh, per, per time unit. So you can test because evolution proceeds fast in this kind of organism or, uh, of, or entities. Uh, you can test a particular uh, population in, or evolutionary hypothesis. They are also very important because they have these high rates of evolutionary. Uh, uh, so they have these high rates of evolution at the level of genes. Uh, they can foster the evolution of these genes. So high mutation and recombination rates. They also uh, exert uh, uh, a very strong selective pressure on populations of organisms, and that is known as um, uh, keeping an arms race. This is also known as the red queen effect. You need to run uh, each time faster to keep at the same place because of the co-evolution, some kind of prey predator type of co-evolution between host and, and parasite, in this case a virus. So they foster the uh, evolution uh, of the host and at the same time they keep at pace with it. And in, in this sense, for instance, they, uh, they have developed also other kind or they are responsible also for other kind of uh, evolutionary strategies that are described as the Cheshire cat. For instance, some viruses are known to affect uh, the diploid or the haploid state of a living organism, let's say the coccolithophoid here, Emiliania haslei. And, and in that sense, they make the population shift towards the other uh, form, whether if the virus affects the diploid form, the population will shift towards the haploid form to escape the virus. So this is also something that is important in evolution on the, on the long run. And finally, and, and most importantly, viruses are very important as uh, vehicles for horizontal gene transfer. And this can lead to innovation in hosts if they transfer one gene from one organism to uh, another organism that will be the host, uh, then they can perhaps lead to uh, an innovative function in another organism. And there are several ways in which uh, viruses can transfer genes from one organism to, a, to another organism. They can do that through lysogenic cycles when one virus inserts in the genome or the, the, the viral genome inserts in the genome of a cell. When it gets out to enter a lactic cycle, for instance, it may pick or bring along with it a piece of the chromosome of the host species and then transmit it to another organism that it is going to infect. <coughs> It can also do that by recombination during infection, so that when they recombine, they can pick up uh, sometimes pieces of the uh, genome with which they are recombining. And also there is another mechanism that is mediated by CRISPR. Uh, these are, uh, I don't know if you are aware of this system, this is an immune system of bacteria, and also archaea, uh, consisting of uh, um, small palindromic repeats within, with, among which uh, you insert uh, viral sequences and these viral sequences are uh, actually the way that it works is that uh, you, the, the cell will make an RNA that is complementary to the, uh, to the uh, viral genome so that it will block the viral genome replication when it enters the cell. Well, the thing is that because you insert these uh, um, viral sequences within this system, you can, when you uh, uh, mediate recombination with the cell containing these CRISPRs, and in this uh, case, also bring along genes of cellular origin to a virus. So, keep, keep 
it might be a idea that they are very active, uh, they cause a horizontal gene transfer. Another uh, element that is very important in this debate is that in, in the past uh, 10, 20 years, there has been a number of discoveries uh, uh, in the viral world that are very important. For instance, um, there, there has been some important work in the case of uh, archaeal viruses that were not known with the discovery of viruses that are of completely new families, very strange, with, with, you see this kind of uh, structures or looking like bottles with appendages, etc. And even viruses, uh, in, in this case all these viruses infect hypothermophilic archaea, and even viruses, here you see a cycle, that have some kind of a developmental life cycle. Uh, it's not a true uh, developmental cycle. These uh, are viruses that in contact with high temperatures will develop appendages, but these are just conformation of changes, protein conformation of changes, but it looks like if it was developing. And this, uh, uh, this will trigger, so high temperature will trigger the form just by conformation of changes that is infective at high temperature where the host lives. Okay? And the other important type of discovery is the, uh, the, the discovery of uh, giant viruses. Viruses such as the mini virus and other um, viruses related to this nucleocytoplasmic large DNA uh, uh, viral family. These viruses have genomes that can be up to 1.2 megabases. This is uh, this is equivalent to the small to a small genome of a bacterium. So uh, they contain many genes, uh, including genes that have homologs in cells. And we will come back to this because this is uh, an important discovery that has triggered some hypotheses. Uh, uh, interesting for us. So, this, uh, in particular, this discovery has led to the revival of an old debate involving viruses, and this is the debate that we would do, I would like to discuss with you. And this debate takes its origin uh, also at the origin of, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, and has to do with uh, the debate on the origin of life itself. Because indeed, viruses were discovered at more or less at the same time that, uh, the, that the scientific community could start asking questions about the origin of life. It is a time, or it was a time, when Louis Pasteur in the 1860s had refuted uh, spontaneous generation in the lab, so continuous continued generation, means that spontaneous generation does not exist, and at the same time, Charles Darwin had uh, already uh, uh, or had published the origin of species, implying that species derive from previous species, so that there is a continuity in the species. So the logical question is, when we arrive to the first species, what happens before? And at the same, that this question could not be answered at the, at, in the 18th century because there was not the progress, the immense, pro, the immense progress that uh, occurred in organic chemistry, biochemi biochemistry, and cytology in the 19th century and, and late 18th century. So at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, people uh, uh, started to think about the question of the origin of life having elements to try to test it or to uh, better understand what could have happened. So as I discussed yesterday in this type of debate on the origin of life, uh, very soon there were two currents of opposed thought or way of thinking that opposed. And this reflected this chicken-egg dichotomy I was talking about yesterday. One type of models uh, proposed uh, that the main characteristic of life and the first thing that appeared was the property of self-replication and in the terminology of the time this corresponded to what they called nucleocentric hypothesis because the, the genetic material was thought to be in the nucleus and uh, on the other hand 
you have the other type of ideas based on self-maintenance. The main property of life would be self-maintenance and the first thing to appear, this uh, uh, kind of thought that I called yesterday metabolic uh, or metabolist hypothesis, were called in this uh, time cytoplasmic because the activities of the cell were occurring in the cytoplasm, essentially. So, because viruses were discovered at the same time and had a very mysterious nature, but also were very small in size and had this infectivity property, they were taken or interpreted by many as the simplest living beings. With this idea in a kind of syllogism that smallest means virus, smallest means first, so the vi virus means first, okay? The idea that because you are simple, you are primitive. So this is what uh, led to some people to think that viruses appeared first. We, didn't, we did not know at the time what were viruses. We did not know that. So actually, from that time on, during the 19th and uh, 20th century, uh, uh, sorry, uh, there were different types, uh, different um, uh, movements uh, that contradicted the previous ones. So the first tendency between 1900 and 1930 uh, was uh, occupied by nucleocentric and virocentric uh, models on the origin of life. So uh, some historical dates, uh, the, the very first uh, uh, individual who proposed that something on the origin of life was Leonard Ronach, who was an American physiologist that proposed in 1914 that the first life form was some kind of enzyme or, 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 or organic catalyst, but soon he spoke of a genetic enzyme. And a bit later, Hermann Muller, and we mentioned yesterday uh, uh, as well, proposed in 1922 that uh, the, the, the proposed the concept of the gene, so he coined the term gene, and he said that the first living organism was a primitive gene, and he equaled gene to virus. So for him, a gene was a virus, or a virus was a gene. Then a bit later, John Haldane uh, uh, said that life may, may have remained in the viral stage for many million of years before the first cells were assembled. Here again, he was using this idea that gene and viruses were equivalent terms. At the time, we didn't know very well what this was, the material uh, uh, which made up genes. And even uh, some authors, some as Alexander and Bridges, uh, proposed that living organisms could be divided into kinds of groups. The cytobiota, the cells, and the ultrabiota, that they interpreted that, that they were the viruses. Okay. Then after the first 30 uh, years in the, of the uh, uh, 20th century, sorry, um, we had a, a reversal and the cytoplasmic models were on the rise. And uh, this was much uh, due to the work by Alexander Oparin, who proposed a model on the origin of life, uh, where he viewed life as uh, a self-regulating system of uh, catalytic reactions, so uh, an autocatalytic cycle of reactions, but also because there were criticisms raised to the idea that simple means primitive. Okay? Okay? Many authors, including Green, but notably Wolf, and, uh, uh, proposed that viruses were just products of the regressive or degenerative evolution, because parasites don't need make many functions because they pick things from the host, so they thought that they were reduced uh, kind of organisms. And John Haldane, who was uh, previously saying that uh, life could have been uh, in the life vital stage for many years, adopted this type of view, and even if he thought that self-reproduction was first, um, he acknowledged that most evolutionary change uh, was degenerative in particular with regard to viruses and that in a living system the cell reproduction and this type of property has to interact with many other components. So it complexified its view. There was then a, a short period in the 20th century 
uh, where again nucleocentric views were on the rise and that was the time when we discovered uh, uh, that DNA was the genetic material in 1944 and uh, that uh, the nucleic acid component of viruses was really the infective uh, uh, element of viruses. And finally, uh, the, uh, the, the, the discovery of DNA structure which offered a very uh, nice self-copy mechanism. But from that time on and during the full second uh, half of the uh, 20th century, uh, uh, these nucleocentric views were completely abandoned and virocentric views were completely abandoned. Uh, why? Again, because work, uh, uh, Oparin's work on the origin of life were much more known uh, on Earth and he thought that viruses were the products of cells and, and not anything different. There were many more advances in biochemistry and molecular biology and we learned how viruses actually work and people realized that viruses are really molecular parasites that depend fully on cells for their reputation. <coughs> So they are like simply selfish genetic elements. And because also, like, uh, until now, viruses have been uh, linked to the origin of life theories. But from this moment, they were uh, uh, supplanted or removed by a much better competitor that was uh, the idea of the RNA world and the, the discovery of ribosome. As I was saying yesterday, ribosomes are RNA molecules that have also catalytic activities. Uh, you, you have here one example of such ribosomes, the hammerhead ribosome. But a, a, a wonderful example of a ribosome is the ribosome, uh, which is essentially uh, a, a RNA uh, molecules working together uh, protected by proteins, but the catalytic center in the ribosome, the peptide bond formation, uh, um, is located uh, or is carried out by the RNA in the ribosome. So this, this is a ribosome. And they provided a very good alternative model uh, to viruses for the origin of life, because they uh, allow to solve this dichotomy between what comes first, proteins or DNA, catalysis or genetic information, by combining the two activities in a single molecule that can at the same time carry genetic information and uh, do catalysis, uh, uh, develop some catalytic properties. However, at the onset of, of the 21st century, we have a renaissance of these old virocentric ideas. And this uh, is due to the, so there are several heterogeneous uh, proposals that uh, make viruses important or central at two different types of level, operational level. Uh, so there are some models that see viruses as living beings, and we will uh, talk about that and also at the phylogenetic level with some models that see viruses as the descendant of a viral lineage that pre-existed cells, or some people think that some viruses form a full domain, domain of life. So we are going to examine this uh, type of models. Very briefly, you have some models that propose that viruses invented uh, DNA, both, um, that the, the replication, the replication ma machinery in the three domains of life have been, uh, or, uh, have been uh, transferred from viruses to, li to uh, cellular lineages. Uh, so supposing that uh, the ancestor had an RNA genome, uh, some authors have supposed that the DNA replication and DNA itself has been transferred by a virus to the bacteria, by another virus to the archaea, and by another virus to, to the eukaryotes. So independently, this is one type of ideas. There are some people that think that uh, viruses uh, are really, uh, in, uh, in, can be integrated in a tree of life, and that organisms should be divided in, in capsid encoding organisms and ribosome encoding organisms. That reminds very much 
to the classification by the Alexander and Bridges in ultraviolta and cytoviolta. So this is a renewal, a renaissance of these very old ideas. There are some other models uh, proposed, notably by Eugene Kunin and colleagues of the ancient virus world. Uh, and this collective set of models, there are several, but all of them resemble in the idea that viruses predate life, cellular life, they would come somehow before cells themselves. And finally, there is a proposal that is much more narrow in, or narrower in the sense that uh, some authors propose that giant viruses that contain many genes, some of which have homologs in cells, form a fourth domain of life. Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's talk first about the conceptual debate, whether viruses are alive or not. So as I said yesterday, there are two major, or two opposed views on the definition of life when you go to the uh, essentials of the definition. One kind of definitions that use uh, self-maintenance or, or think that self-maintenance is the important property of cells whether the others on the opposite think that uh, self-replication, information, is the important part uh, of cells and of life. So, if you uh, now try to uh, quest ask yourself, are viruses alive? If you take a definition that I would call metabolist, for which self-maintenance is the important uh, thing, because viruses lack metabolism, they don't know how to uh, uh, transform energy and matter, viruses would not be alive. Okay? Viruses cannot do anything in cells who do things for uh, viruses. So they are set in this sense to have a borrowed life. They borrow life from cells. Nevertheless, some authors have tried to make viruses enter in that kind of ref definition, even if they lack metabolic activity, some authors have proposed uh, that, in a sense, uh, we are wrong because we, uh, most biologists, interpret viruses as being vi videos, and of course, videos are not active. And they say that the true essence of, vi of the virus is the virus that is infecting a cell. And then viruses should be called viral cells, actually. So, okay, so there are different authors, Lavery and Forter, proposing virus fa factory or virus or virus cell as the true essence of a virus. And they say that this would be something equivalent to fish and fish eggs. So, fish eggs, not fish, like videos, are not uh, viral cells, and that the true essence of viruses is the virus cell, and the true essence of fish is to be in fish. But this seems very strange for biologists, because of course we biologists know that these are two different forms of a, of a developmental cycle. So fish eggs are fish, just as virions are viruses, and these are simply different uh, reproductive forms, uh, or different uh, 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 forms in the life cycle, or in the reproductive cycle of an organism. So this is something uh, strange. Furthermore, in this case of a, a virus cell, the virus is defined as the virus plus its host. So if you have, now, if you, you can make the same analogy for fish, and if you have a fish that is parasitic of another fish, let's say a remora, would you say that the remora is the shark plus the remora or not? Or if, if you have another kind of parasite, the tapeworm that is parasitizing humans, you would say that this, you would define this parasite as this parasite plus the human it is infecting? Or when you have the flu, would you say that you are virus? So actually, no, this is, this is logic. So actually, this type of view uh, or is, just, is nothing but an artifice to transfer artifactually the properties that are intrinsic from cells to the virus. And actually, the, the virus lacks these properties. There is a the capacity to transform energy and matter. So I think personally, what we think, because uh, David is uh, at the origin of all these ideas, that this is somehow epistemological cheating because you, you try to acquire the properties of a thing when you are not that thing. 
but this is, uh, of course, uh, a conceptual debate. Um, what happens if we now take the other definition of life based on self-replication? For geneticists' views, actually, uh, viruses are not able to self-replicate. If you take the property self-replication, viruses alone are not able to self-replicate. They need the cells to replicate because they use the machinery of the cells. So in this sense, they would not be alive. But some people still think that because they evolve, viruses are alive. The problem is that they do not evolve by themselves. They are evolved by cells because cells are the entities that are dividing the viruses. So actually, if you want to uh, make viruses enter this type of definition, you have to make two concessions. Or you can do two things. Either define, uh, enlarge or enlarge the definition of life to include everything that evolves or is evolved so you can say that everything that evolves or is evolved is alive, but then this would include viruses, but also many other things such as language or cuisines or, or songs. This, uh, this is what uh, Richard Dawkins calls memes. So this would be alive as well. So this is a possibility. And the other possibility is to extend the definition of a virus to include not only what we know now as viruses, which are unable to self-replicate, but also to include virus-like self-replicating entities. Uh, and, and, and this is what the virus uh, one model proposes, that there, there, there were many virus-like self-replicated entities before cells, but self-replicating entities, as we know today, actually they should be called replicants and not viruses. They act in the authors, Kunin uh, and colleagues, call them virus-like, meaning they are not really viruses. So this idea is confusing, but it would be acceptable within this type. The hypothesis is acceptable, except that the terminology is not. They shouldn't be called viruses, they should be called replicants. Anyway. So, this is the conceptual debate. Let's enter now the phylogenetic debate. On the, that is most more practical, let's say. Can, we, can viruses be placed in the tree of life? We forget about the definition, we just want to ask whether uh, viruses can be placed in the tree of life. And here again, we enter another type of debate, and it is what is a tree of life? Because there are problems. Normally, a tree of life is a, a representation or a theoretical representation of what organism, uh, the evolution of organisms uh, look, look like or should look like. Uh, and the, the, pro the problem here is that uh, uh, is what are the characters that we use to, re to reconstruct such tree of life? Because of course organisms physically derive from organisms so normally evolution should proceed by bifurcation and you could depict this bifurcation as a tree. The problem is that uh, in practice, what you use now today to reconstruct trees, such organi organismal trees, are genes. And genes sometimes can be transferred. And then uh, there are two views on, on, on this matter. One thing is that for metabolists' views, they think uh, of life um, uh, in a way that is organism centered. So the important thing is the organism, and the, for these views, uh, the, there is the possibility to reconstruct a tree of life that would represent a tree of organisms by using genes, even if there are uh, some cases of horizontal gene transfer. But the major uh, evolution or uh, the organismal evolution wouldn't be blurred by horizontal gene transfer. For instance, using some core gene trees uh, to reconstruct the tree of life. Okay? But on the other side, many people say that horizontal gene transfer is too massive and too important, and that actually we cannot reconstruct the tree of life that represents organismal evolution. That that cannot be done, 
that the only thing that we can do is to reconstruct networks of genes and genomes, or some other people would say just forests of genes. So actually there is this uh, two opposed views. Some people think that we can reconstruct a tree of life based on organisms, and others, which are more meta uh, geneticists' views, for which uh, an organism is nothing more than an assortment of genes, of genes of different origin. So the, we are here in, in front of a paradox, because for geneticist views, the, those for which perhaps viruses could be considered alive, a, a tree of life actually does not exist, because horizontal gene transfer has been too important. So this is something that I uh, put in front of you for, uh, for thought. But, okay, nevertheless, let's go to the practical things. We have two different kinds of situations and two different types of models. Uh, first, the virus world and related models that indeed recognize that it is impossible to place viruses in a tree of life because there is no single gene shared by all viral families. Actually, as you know, there are RNA viruses, DNA viruses, many different families. And there are certain genes that are shared within one family, but that are not shared between different families. So there are not proteins or genes that are shared by all, by all viruses. That doesn't exist. So they know that. And there is not, uh, they lack structural continuity, and there is what they call genome volatility, because they evolve too fast. It's very difficult to make uh, inferences about uh, the distant past. Nevertheless, these people would say, or say actually, that there are still some hallmark viral genes that are largely distributed and or protein folds that are absent from cells. And that these motifs, uh, which are especially in particular related to the capsid formation, um, is a proof or an evidence for a common origin predating cells. Okay? So they say that there are some, even if genes are not shared between all viruses, there are some cap capsid folds that are shared by many different families, and these should be ancestral, even if the primary sequence of the corresponding genes has nothing to do. But the fold, the three-dimensional structure, is resembled. The problem, that is a possibility, but there are problems with that. So we are going to study this. In particular, they put as an example the jelly roll capsid protein, which is a fold that is shared by viruses that are uh, as distant as some viruses infecting archaea and eukaryotes. Okay? So they say that uh, this is ancestral. But there are alternative explanations for that sharing. One is convergence that happens in evolution especially in, in the case of simple geometrical uh, uh, structures uh, because you have very strong three-dimensional constraints. And here you, get, you have a wonderful example of convergence, that is the structure of carboxysomes, which is uh, the place where carbon fixation takes place, in, uh, in this case photosynthetic bacteria, cyanobacteria, and then icosahedral viruses, they look very much uh, alike. They are icosahedral structures, something that these are viruses, and these are uh, carbon fixation centers. And people would say, yes, but more complex structures are much more difficult to reach by convergence. And I would argue that sometimes you can find uh, very amazing examples of convergence, uh, uh, and this is one of those, this is a very uh, 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 complex structure that is uh, um, called an eye in dinoflagellates, some particular dinoflagellates, it has a kind of retina and uh, uh, a legs with pigments, and it actually has functional convergence too because it, it serves to this cell, these are in, in unicellular eukaryotes, some kind of bodies belonging to the dinoflagellates, the, this structure sets the, the cell to see, and actually when it sees a prey, it uh, projects this extrusome to capture the prey. So it really works, it's a, uh, it works like, like an eye, so it is a wonderful example of convergence. Okay. But there are other alternatives. 
uh, and uh, perhaps even more, much more likely, that is horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer is extensive among viruses. It is also very important in uh, cellular organisms, but it's particularly extensive among viral lineages. We saw that because viruses have really, uh, they are, they, they easily recombine. And then uh, there are multiple examples of horizontal gene transfer events between families of uh, double-stranded RNA viruses, for instance, but there are also uh, various examples of recombination of horizontal gene transfer between, R R between RNA and DNA viruses, so viruses that have nothing to do, possibly mediated by the host, because at some time the two genomes coexist during the same cell. <coughs> so, uh, this is a very important alternative uh, and likely uh, hypothesis to explain why a particular motif is found in different viral uh, families. And finally, there is another explanation, there is host shift. Host shifts occur in nature, and, and there is one example that is the, uh, the example of head and tail viruses that are thought to have been uh, that are present, infect several kinds of bacteria, but are also found to infect some uriarchaea, some halophytes, halophilic archaea. So they have, uh, they are thought to be uh, host shifts between bacterial viruses and uh, archaeal viruses. So this is another potential explanation. So to the question of can structural motifs shared by uh, by yeast and viral lineages be a proof? of ancient and common origin, the answer is no. And it is no because alternative hypotheses, including convergence, host shifts, but most of all horizontal gene transfer, cannot be um, refuted or discarded. Nevertheless, OK, this is a hypothesis. They can have as a hypothesis that that kind of motives are ancestral, but it's not proven. There are alternative hy hypotheses that are more likely. Okay, and finally, my last point, and this is really, we, we, we can make here a statement, is that some people think that some particular viruses, these giant uh, double-stranded viruses, nucleosidoplasmic DNA viruses, form a fourth domain of life. Because they share some genes with cells. This type of models can be tested. Contrary to the previous one, we cannot, that cannot be tested. Here you can test it because you can test it with molecular phylogeny because molecular phylogeny compares homologous genes or proteins. And here we do have homologous genes shared by viruses and cells, so we can test it. So there are different possibilities to, uh, 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 here. So there could be that genes um, uh, a, a genes shared by viruses and cells uh, display in a tree like this. Viruses form a monophyletic group and the three cellular domains form monophyletic groups. This would imply a common origin and this would imply that viruses form a fourth domain of life. One, two, three and four. Another possibility is that the genes in viruses uh, or in cells have derived from viruses, for instance, okay, and in this case you would expect to find the cellular uh, uh, genes emerging from within a viral tree, from a, a viral branch, forming a monophyletic group. And actually there are some examples of this, rare, they are rare, but they are known. For instance, there is one famous case that, that corresponds to uh, uh, the RNA, the mitochondrial RNA polymerase that is coming in most eukaryotes from uh, uh, a, viral, uh, a viral protein and when you make a phylogenetic tree in blue you have the mitochondrial one and in, in green and red you have the plasmid and phages one, so the viral ones essentially. In this case it has been a transfer to the ancestor of mitochondria in these uh, groups. But this is rare. And if you expect, and the third case would be when uh, the uh, viral and cellular genes are mixed like this, in this case, you have horizontal gene transfer from the host. You have the, the viral gene 
places very close to the host gene. Most of the cases that we know so far belong to this category. When you make phylogenetic trees of genes that are shared between uh, viruses and cells, in most cases, what you see is that the uh, viral genes here in green are placed close to the host genes, and here again with subtilis, etc. And this is also the case for some genes that are present in cytophages belonging to the photosynthesis, to the photosystem that have nothing to do in viruses because viruses don't make photosynthesis, but mainly cyanophages, phages infecting cyanobacteria, they carry these genes uh, and they are intermixed with the genes of their hosts because it, uh, it helps the infection process. It makes the work, the cell work better for the virus. So it's uh, adaptive. So, what happens with this um, four domain? So, uh, in 2004, Raul and collaborators proposed that this family of uh, large viruses, the mini virus et al., uh, form a fourth domain of life. So we would be in this type of situation. And they, they, they did so because they made a phylogenetic tree concatenating seven, seven different proteins, and they put the mini virus here in red uh, in a tree of life. But, uh, and then the mini virus appeared to be at the base of the eukaryotes here. So they concluded from this that the mini virus form a full domain of life at the base of the eukaryotes. However, there are several, or there are two major problems with this particular tree. The first one is low branch attraction. That is something very well known among molecular phylogenet phylogeneticists. And it is that when you have one gene that evolves much faster than the rest, by um, this type of uh, phenomenon, especially if you use simple models of sequence evolution, this particular gene in viral genes evolve very fast, tend to be placed at the base of the tree. Okay? This is called a long branch attraction phenomenon. And the, the only problem that is affecting that particular tree is poor sampling. When you have very poor sampling, so your gene here uh, will, will appear as, at the base of, as being at the base of these two sequences. But if you include many more sequences, especially in the case of viruses, sequences belonging to the hosts, then you will see that actually the gene was in the middle of host proteins or genes, except that it, as you didn't include it, then here you don't see it. So you would conclude, have a wrong conclusion simply because you don't include enough something, enough genes belonging to very different species for these organisms or for these genes in particular. So, in the particular case that we were seeing, there were many, there were very few uh, species, and this particular tree was affected by no branch attraction. And when you take one of the genes that were used for that initial tree, um, and you include many more species, so gen uh, genes for many more species, including notably genes from amoeba, this is a virus affecting amoeba, some kind of amoeba, so when you include amoeba, what you see is that the mini virus does not appear at the base of the eukaryotes as in the original formulation, but it is well nested within the eukaryotes. Furthermore, it is very close to the amoeba genes, and we know that the amoeba, uh, the amoeba are a host, not this particular one, but other kind of amoeba are the host of this mini virus. So you can conclude in this case that there has been a horizontal gene transfer from the host to the mini virus, and not the opposite, not the, uh, and the, not, that mean virus is not the fourth domain of life. Okay, and when you do that with uh, all the genes in the genomes of these kind of viruses, what you realize is actually that uh, these giant viruses are giant chimeras. They have many genes that have no homologs with anything in databases, but those that have homologs in cells when you analyze them, you realize that most of them are either eukaryotic or bacterial, and in this amoeba there are many bacteria that are co-infected, so these genes come likely from this type of bacteria. 
and actually, uh, uh, so that these uh, these genes are have been acquired by the viruses from the host and not the other way around. Or, nevertheless, this is funny because we uh, publish these uh, arguments and this explanation, trying to say that there is no these viruses do not form a fourth domain of life, and we were of course criticized by the authors of this uh, proposal. And one of the authors, Jean-Michel Claverie, published uh, a paper saying that there were 10 good reasons to really uh, include uh, or not to exclude gyruses. Now he shifted to use gyruses, giant viruses, from the evolutionary picture. And they, they proposed new genes that would be a, conf a proof or a confirmation for that. These two genes corresponded to the, the were genes shared by the MIDI virus and uh, another kind of virus uh, infecting ground algae here. And these genes were the definitive proof for them uh, that these viruses form a fourth domain because they were branching again at the base of the uh, eukaryotic tree. However, when you take, again, you see that there are very few representatives here. And actually, when you take many more genes from many more organisms, you realize that the picture is a little bit more complex. And actually, these two genes are paralogous. So they have three paralogous copies, so paralog 1, paralog 2, and paralog 3. And that the two uh, genes actually, when they incorporate genes from the host, they, are not, they do not appear at the base forming a fourth domain of life. But the, the three copies mix with uh, eukaryotic organism, and they are, furthermore, in some cases where you have enough resolution, they are close to uh, the genes of their potential host, so amoeba in the case of mini virus, and uh, uh, stramenopi in the case of uh, this uh, uh, brown algal virus. So this, again, uh, favors the idea that these genes were acquired by viruses independently, the three copies, from their hosts, and not that they form a fourth domain at the base of the tree of uh, eukaryotes. So, another, uh, uh, another example that I would like to show is that the first person who's, who proposed that the mini virus form a fourth domain of life, uh, Didier Raoult, in 2004, some years later, to avoid criticism, and this will be my last slide, uh, propose uh, uh, that actually there is no a tree of life and of course viruses are out. So in a sense, this uh, is uh, shifting from a metabolist view where organisms uh, or where trees are supposed to represent organisms to a geneticist view where vi uh, trees do not exist, and then, of course, viruses do not belong to a tree of life because a tree of life don't exi doesn't exist. And he has even more funny uh, ideas right now, but nobody understands that very well. <laughs> so, in conclusion, um, so uh, the, the, this discussion, this epistemological discussion about whether viruses are alive or not, and whether these some virus like forms. Uh, precede the first cell is of course a matter of debate that needs to be understood in this uh, dichotomic view of life, metabolism versus genes. Uh, but in any case, we can discuss about that and there are different possibilities there. But what we can say now is that viruses cannot be included in the tree of life because for geneticists' views, a tree of life does not exist and in the case of metabolists' view, uh, those views that think of organisms as being able to be depicted by uh, the, the evolution of which is being, uh, can be depicted by a tree. This type of life exists, but attempts to incorporate vi virus into it are artificial because they do not share a common ancestry. So you, don't, you cannot make phylogeny with, if you don't have a character that is shared by everyone. And then, because the genes that are share between cells and viruses can be in the vast majority of cases be shown to be to have been acquired from host by the viruses and not the other way around. Okay, so 
There's no, the viruses do not form a photomate over life and cannot be placed in phylogenetic groups. And with that, I thank you for your attention. What do you think the uh, relationship are between viruses and plasmids? Because uh, plasmids uh, can be considered as some kind of molecular parasites also. Yes, I agree with you absolutely. And they are highly related. Actually, many of these uh, plasmids may have been viruses that have simply lost uh, the capacity to be encapsulated. And many of these DNA polymerases, or, uh, they, they are homologous. So they, some of these uh, viral families uh, can be linked phylogenetically with uh, some particular families of plasmids. So there is a clear relationship, at least of some viral and, pla um, and plasmid families. So yeah, I would I would say that uh, they share some uh, common origin at some so, point. And uh, viruses were first. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know which came first. I don't know, but they are related. So you can say maybe some of them could be the. Re derived from viruses that are infected, or maybe the other, the opposite way. You, you get uh, uh, some kind of uh, auto autonomous replicas within the cell, and then escape, that can escape. But I don't know. I, uh, Thank you. I don't have any answer <coughs> for that. Uh, Julie, thanks a lot for your talk, and um, mm, it would be interesting to know if uh, you also carry out some Field and lab work with viruses as part of your research, and uh, if uh, so, then which group of viruses does looks most promising in, okay. in this? Okay. Oh, um, um, um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a lot of work already with organisms, two organisms, meaning cells. 
so it's, it's not in a direct plan, though we have in particular, David has, has done some work on, on gen vital genomes that are already existing, but lately we have been uh, working just a little bit with these viruses because one of the things that we are doing is studying metagenomes from the deep ocean. Uh, and we made a phosmid libraries, and it happens then within these phosmid libraries we capture um, some viruses. And so, in collaboration with uh, Francisco Rodriguez Varela, we are doing some work on these uh, viral genomes that come from the deep ocean. So it's a kind of metagenomic analysis of viruses, but it is not our major focus. So we have worked on viruses more from the theoretical and molecular phylogenic point of view because we are interested in the origin of evolution of life in general and viruses are very important agents so we think viruses are very important in evolution um, and even in maybe why not for the origin of eukaryotes because they are really vehicles from, for transferring genes but we don't think that viruses are alive and they constitute a fourth domain of life well, that they constitute a fourth domain of life can be really refuted uh, experimentally, then you can think whether they are alive or not. You can discuss it theoretically because the fourth domain of life is out. Even by the pro uh, former proposers, so they are now saying different things that they are either cells, degenerated cells, or that uh, trees of life don't exist. And uh, 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 more details on deep sea metagenomics are coming in one of your further lectures, right? Um, but it won't be. Uh, it won't be virus, it, it, will be, it, it will be archaea and horizontal gene transfer, so more on organismal uh, grounds, let's say. Thanks. I want to thank you for your lecture, it was very interesting. I have a question. So we see that the viruses have uh, genetic material, mm -hmm. and we also say that they uh, may be or may be not living species. How can we understand this? It's like uh, comparing an object to the viruses. And can we say that this may be, be an accident, that the viruses might happen to an accident, and they now have material? It is clear that viruses have uh, emerged uh, independently several times, because you have viruses with different types of genetic material. So there are at least six or seven different origins for viruses. Uh, so this would favor uh, seven or six uh, different uh, accidents, to my point of view. So that's uh, what I would say. So the fact that they have um, they have emerged independently in evolution, we don't know when, but independently several times, would argue in favor of uh, an accident like uh, so an escape, uh, a replicon escape from the cell. Uh, so that, that would favor that. And again, um, regarding the definition of a virus, whether it is alive or not, it's uh, dependent on the, defini on the definition of life. So according, if you define life in one way, you can include viruses. If you define life in another way, you should exclude viruses. Mm -hmm. It's all point of view. Uh, uh, it's not necessarily point of view. You can stick to a definition and try to, to see what is the best definition for life. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I would like... Mm, I think that life needs... Uh, okay, I would take the physicist's point of view. Uh, life uh, should be or uh, uh, an, a system that is far from thermodynamic equilibrium and that creates order from this order. That is needed. If you don't have that, you're dead. That's the dynamic death. You, you go to a pure house and this person, and you're dead. So you need to create some order to put some energy to create order for this or from this order to make cellular structures and to make activities. Viruses don't do that. If you inseminate one planet with viruses, they will just decay and disappear. Just, yeah, the, the organic matter will be simply destroyed. You need cells to make activities and to make, uh, yeah, to, to, to make biochemistry. And that's, without biochemistry, viruses or cells couldn't exist. You need some system that is able to transform energy and matter. 
Without that, you cannot have replicative polymers or whatever. You need something that transforms energy and matter. That, is, that would be my point of view. Now, for the for a system that contains that is able to transform energy and matter to persist a long time, the solution that life on this planet has taken is to find replicative polymers that know how to code the system. So for me, there is a bidirectional uh, interaction. It's a, there's a strict interaction between, in practical terms, uh, a system that is able to persist during time and, and information, the information is